So today's presentation is about six key focus points of, for website success. So the whole goal or point of this presentation is to give you some pointers that will help you with auditing your own entire website. Or if you are helping out another team or part of a communications team, you can go through and find things that will help you improve your optimization, not improve optimization, but conversions will help improve your speed, will help improve security, your branding and design of your website to help ensure your success and also help with optimization technique. So you know what to test, how to test and what to look for and try to figure out how to extract points from data to help you set guidelines for testing. And we'll learn a lot of those techniques throughout today's presentation. And also as a big bonus for dropping in, I'm going to send you the presentation slides that I are going, I'm going to show you today. Also, I have an ebook as well that gives a little more in-depth information about a lot of the topics I'm going to discuss. And then I'll follow up with some of the information as well. There's not in the presentation, but I'll give you as other pointers. I'll follow up via email with you and send it out so you can have it for your own reading. So without further ado, let's jump right to it. First, a little about myself. My name is George Woodard. I'm a full-time WordPress developer and a marketing website specialist. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. I work with nonprofits and B2B businesses to help optimize their website so it can target their target audience, help improve conversions for SEO, accessibility, speed, and security. And I love what I do. It's fun to do. I've been enjoying this, like I said, for over 10 years now, and I've got a chance to work with people all over. So the presentation today is just another way of showing some of the fun that I get to look at and help you see the fun and what, what your website can help offer you. So first, um, how is your website? Your website is a 24 seven marketing machine. And just like owning a car, it requires regular maintenance. And that's something, believe it or not, that a lot of people believe that a website is a set it or forget it type part of your marketing, which is not true because just like a car, just like any software, whether you have a cell phone, a laptop, software requires updating. And just like your website, when there's changes, not only in software, like for example, I'm a WordPress developer. So WordPress has periodic updates. You want to make sure you're up to date there. As well as like your marketing, you have Google, they're notorious for making changes to the algorithm for the search engine. So you want to make sure that your website is hitting the points that's needed for them to recommend your website to visitors, people who are looking for the services or products that you may be offering. So you want to make sure you look after it, make sure it's easy to use and you want to keep it relevant. So your audience will be, be there for you and they'll come looking for you, looking for the services that you offer. But with that said, let's jump into six areas that you should focus on. And the first, and let me adjust this here. The first is the website design. So we all know your website is like your first impression. Whenever people are Googling, looking for services. They always find what they're looking for, click on it, and then they get to the website. And then the design is the very first thing that they see. So a common analogy that I use in web development is relating your website to building a house. So in this case, the design of your website is your curb appeal. So how well does your website present itself to the world is what you should ask yourself. If someone were to use Google street view, for example, to find your house, would they be impressed or repulsed? And that's the same exact way you want to think about with the design of your website. When they search for what they're looking for based on whatever search terms they input, and then they find your website, when they land on your homepage or whatever page comes up first that provides the information they need, are they impressed? Does it bring them in? Does it draw them in? Or are they repulsed? Are things out of place? Is it hard to find information? Is it things like text? Is it legible or is it hard to try to click? Another big point is responsiveness of your website, which is a fancy word of saying, can they use it on multiple devices, whether it's an iPhone, it's a MacBook, they're using it on a tablet, or in these days, people can actually browse the web from their TV. Are they able to navigate your website doing the same thing? Is it hard for them to click on items? Is it hard for them to locate information? Those type of things go into the design of your website and you want to make sure that you give it a fresh look. You want to make sure it's cohesive. 
because there's issues sometimes where we make changes. There are branding initiatives that happen and a lot of things may get changed throughout the time. And you want to make sure that they all match the brand of the organization. And the best way to do that is to make sure you have brand guidelines. And that's another topic for another day. But the point here is just make sure that design that you present, it doesn't have to be grandose. It's just as long as it's clean, it's concise, and it's easy for your visitors to. And that moves over to the next point is the user experience. It's right behind the design for a simple reason. What good is a tow truck if you can't tow your car? It's the same way with the user experience. What good is a look, good looking website if visitors can't do or find what they came to look for? All right, I'm going to give you a few stats here. So according to Amazon Web Services, 88% of visitors say they wouldn't return to a website after having a bad user experience. So to make it simple, if you had 100 visitors in a month and aiming for a 1% conversion goal, all you need is one new client. And what that, how could that benefit you if you have one new client? If your website has a poor user experience, you've already disqualified 88 of those 100 visitors. So that leaves you with a lower chance of conversion of just 22 people. And honestly, in my guess, if 88% of the people are disqualified, the other 22 are really not too far behind them. So you want to make sure that the experience that people are having when they visit your website is a pleasant one. And again, it doesn't have to be grandiose. That's a, a common misconception. After working in this field for so long, that's a common misconception that people have. They want to put all the flashy elements. They want to make sure things are whizzing past the page. They want to have all of these interactions going on the website. If your website is built or you're in an industry that is more service-based or you're providing consultations and things like that, less is more. You want to dial back a lot of those interactive elements. You want to make sure that, hey, when they land on your website, can they find or at least get to in a very easy way the information that they came to look for. One common rule in web development is called the three-click rule. And simply what that means is, does it take a visitor three or less clicks to get to where they're trying to go? And that's really it. You want to make your user experience for all your visitors to be that simple. And then there's a lot of quick wins that you can do to try to help you out. And here's a few that I'm going to show you. So these are five checks that your visitors to let you know that they're having a good user experience. Do they understand your message? Is your message clear? Do they com does it take them a long time to understand what you do? Or does your USP or unique selling proposition tell them exactly how you can solve the problem that they have? Number two, is it easy to contact? Do you have contact forms? Is your address visible if they need to mail something? Phone numbers, are they easily accessible? And especially on mobile devices, if you have a phone number, you can actually convert the phone numbers into links. So if people click on it, it takes them to their phone on their device and be able to call you directly. Things like that. Is it easy to get in touch with you when they need to? Um, can they navigate your website with ease? Again, that refers to the three click rule that I was talking about. How easy is it for them to get from point A to point B? You want to make that transition or that experience, I should say, as easy as possible. One thing I know a lot of people would like to have, but only works on a certain type of website is the big navigation menus where you hover or click on it and it has 40, 50 different elements. In a lot of entertainment-based websites, that works well, but when you're more informational or transactional, you don't want to expand stuff like that too big because then that can impact the user experience, especially on mobile, because that's a lot of scrolling that your user would have to do. And then sometimes on desktop, it can hide things and makes it hard for people to try to access it. Um, number four is clear call to action. How easy is it for them to get in contact with you and make a conversion? This is something similar to a newsletter. If your goal for the next quarter is to increase your newsletter base by a thousand subscribers, how easy is it for them to input their email and hit subscribe? A lot of people would like to have their forms on the page, which works well, 
but another is also thinking about exit intents. And what that is, if you've ever gone to a website and then you moved your cursor off the page and then a box pop up, that's called an exit intent. There are numerous ways that you can capture people to sign up for your newsletter, but just to call to actions, not even just newsletter, is it material that you're providing, whether it's like a brochure, a checklist, a sheet, some type of lead magnet, is it easy for them? And it's clear to tell them this is the action that they will be taking if they click this button. And number five is trust that. Are you a part of associations? Are you a part of groups? Does it show that you're relevant or you've been, you've shown experience in your zone of expertise? For example, and I'll go back and show you something on this slide. This is what you would consider trust factors. On the left-hand side, you see my badge where it shows I'm a certified WordPress developer. And then on the right side, it shows you that I'm a digital business consultant. The same thing occurs on other websites. If you are in construction that shows, you can show us house where it shows that you have plenty of reviews, your Google reviews, but does it show all of your positive reviews that people could see prior clients that have worked with you testimonials. That's another trust factor where people can provide their experience about working with you. So that's just a lot of different ways that you can show your trust on your website. And moving on to our next point, search engine visibility. Now this is a hugely talked about subject, but there's a lot of cloudiness around it and a lot of misstated information. So I'm going to try to make this as clear as possible, but what you want to do is make it important, an important point to make sure your website is visible in search engines. And what I'm referring to is when you go to Google, you type in a search term, how easy is it for Google to recommend your website to your visitors? And the goal there is to make sure two things is that, like I said, your website is being recognized by Google or just search engines in general, because Google is the biggest one, but you have Bing and you have a few others, Yahoo and plenty of others out there. And that your website copy or content is optimized for the correct keywords. Usually when you nail those two, you should continue to optimize for marketing, but that will help you get a big start. And to show you some tips in this, I'm going to show you a few tools and things that I've used before. So here's one. If you notice at the top in the search bar, the word site, and then behind it is a code. And then after that is my domain, lsquare.com. What this does, if you type it in Google, it will show that Google has indexed your site. And I'll put this in the chat real quick. So if you type that in and of course replace your domain.com with your actual domain, what this will show in Google is that Google has actually indexed your site. And if it comes up and shows pages on your site, that's a good thing. That means that Google recognizes that your site is a credible website, that they're actively crawling is what it's called, but actively scanning your website to see if there are any changes. And this is also another point of making sure your content and copy is fresh and up to date, because if you're constantly updating it, whether it's through blog posts or new projects, research material, what have you. The more that you do, that increases your chances for being found in Google based off of certain search terms. And to also know or find out what search terms that you would want to target is going to be on the next slide. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. This right here is a tool that Google provides called Google Keyword Planner. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Google provides a free tool where you're able to type in words related to your business or related to the services that you offer, and it will turn a list of keywords that match your search. So in the top box, that is where I typed in WordPress web developer. And when I type that in, that is a set of or string of keywords that I would like to research to see what hits that I can get or what ideas I can get from it. And on the next tab, you can actually see there is a option that says start with your website. And this is a little trick that many people may or may not know, but it'll allow you to ethically spy on your competition. What you can do in this box is when you click on this tab and put in the URL, either for your own website, if you want to see what your website is ranking for keywords, or if you want to look at competitors, 
you can put it in that box, put their URL in that box, and it'll show you what keywords that they're ranking for or what keywords that Google is actually recognizing their website for. This is helpful for you because then you can see where you can fit in or maybe what keywords you can try to take off or try not to rank for on your website. And on this next slide, it's going to show you an output of what that looks like. So whenever you put in your keywords, then it will put out this list here where you can see all of the keywords or keyword ideas that are related to the keywords that you input on the previous screen. In the first column, the very first option is the one that you entered. And then the column results under that are other ideas to give you some options. A good rule of thumb is maybe to select anywhere from three to five keywords as a focus initially, and then you can expand from there. In the right-hand column, or the right hand two columns. The first one is average results or searches. And this is a range of average monthly searches that occur for the keyword on the left hand side. And then to the far right is the competition. So if you choose to run paid ads at some point in the Google network, I'll put it that way. If you choose to run paid ads with Google, this will tell you how competitive it is to rank for the keywords that you're looking at. Going back to the search results, if you ever typed in anything in Google and the ads that may come up at the top, this is what that's referring to. So if you're searching for a certain keyword and it has a low competitiveness, that means you have an easier possibility for obtaining a spot at the top or in the ad for that keyword. And I didn't put that in there, but also you can, you'll be able to see the cost per click if you were to launch a paid ad campaign and usually low competitive keywords have lower cost. And inversely, higher keywords have higher costs. So this is something that a lot of teams can use, a lot of marketing communica communication teams can use to be able to see how they rank, where they're ranking, what keywords they can and should rank for and it can help drive ideas for writing your content. Moving on is conversion optimization. This is a big one. So basically conversion optimization is the process of wanting to increase the percentage of visitors to your website that carry out a specified action or event, whether it's making a donation, purchasing a program, registering for membership, what have you. Whatever goal that you set out is the, uh, action that you want them to do and tracking that is the conversion and being able to optimize it is conversion optimization. So the conversion rate that you define for yourself is the percentage and it's using a simple formula. So it's the action number, which is the number of people who perform the specified action divided by the visitor number. And it is, you guessed it, the number of visitors to your website. And then you multiply that by a hundred. So for example, let's assume your website received 5,000 visitors last month and you had 65 event registrations. So using that formula, you would divide 65 by 5,000, which gives you 0 0.013. You multiply that by 100 and that gives you a conversion rate of 1.3%. Now, a lot of people see that as an extremely low number. But honestly, that's actually not a bad conversion rate. In most industries, typical conversion rates land anywhere between two and 5%, depending on what the product is and also price points, because different price points have higher or lower conversion rates. But this is an a actionable um, equation that you can use to help set some goals for your website. And then also, and these are ways that you can actually improve your conversion rate. Again, how easy is the contact? Do you have a noticeable phone number? What is your primary call to action? Whether it's in the header or if it's what's called below the fold, which is a certain scroll point on your website. Do you have a primary call to action? Can they register for the event immediately? Can they schedule a consultation? Can they book a call? Anything like that. Primary call to action adding that on the main landing page or adding it on your homepage is very vital. Lead capture forms. These could be newsletter signups, contact forms, even forms that are used to register to obtain content from you, like applications for certain events. 
if you have forms that can do that, they can be phone enrolled into your CRM. Testimonial and reviews. This is falling under the trust factor. When clients or people are working with you and you gather testimonials, do you have them readily or easily viewable on your website? Same thing for reviews. Google has widgets. A lot of different platforms have widgets that you can actually embed on your website to show the reviews people have le left you and that can help boost your trust for uh, the potential, whether it's clients, p uh, visitors, or uh, potential partners that you want to work with. Online help. Now, this is a one that kind of lean towards, do you have live chat? Some, for some websites, that's a viable idea having a live chat box to be able to immediately stay in touch with your visitors. This also means an option for a knowledge base. Do you have a repository of knowledgeable information about your service products or your business that visitors can use? Another one is FAQs. You get a lot of questions or you field a lot of questions from clients or potential clients. And, um, if it's frequent information or frequent questions, it's good to have FAQs to help solve the, not solve, but answer those questions up front. And then when it comes time for them to contact you or make that desired goal or action that you want them to, they already have been pre-educated about what it takes or what's involved in the process of working with you. So these are much, there are many others, but these are some of the main ways that will help you improve your conversion rate. Now, moving on to our next tip is website speed. So website speed is the first impression. And as we all know, first impressions really count. They're the first, it's the first impression that people have when they come to your website. Design is a big one, but speed also plays into that factor. And it rolls in under as an option under the user experience. How fast does your website load? How fast does it transition from the click that they've made on whatever material they're trying to get to the next page? That is pertinent that you have a fast loading website, not only for the user experience, but also for search engine results. I am fully aware and many people may or may not know that Google actually penalizes websites for them being slow. And it's not just for desktop either, it's for desktop for mobile experience and for tablets, because desktop experience has a different experience than mobile devices typically don't have the same speeds or the same processing power as a uh, desktop does. So you want to make sure your website is optimized to, to be used on those different media. Delivering a fast website experience allows you to build trust with your visitors and it actually keeps them engaged and understand a lot more of what you do. There are a lot of factors that come down to how fast your website loads. And a few of them are quality hosting. This is a big one that I try to educate people on that cheap is not always better. Or the old saying is that you get what you pay for. I know a lot of hosting companies advertise these cheaper plans. Some of them are quality hosts, but a lot of times with the cheaper hosting options, what happens is you're sharing processing resources with other websites you may not even know exist. And if someone on that same server, going back to the housing analogy, if you're using a cheaper host, usually that's what's called shared hosting and you're living in an apartment. So if another tenant is overusing the resources in the building, that affects your experience, the same concept there. So if another website on the server is using all of the processing resources, that can cause your website to slow down quite a bit. So that's why I fully support going with a VPS or cloud hosting provider, or if you are capable in the budget to go hire, get like a dedicated server only for like super custom websites, but most people can go with the cloud or VPS hosting. Another point that goes into speed is website file size. Mostly if you're using a CMS such as WordPress, the file size for your website will stay relatively small. Where it expands or explodes is when you start adding media elements to it, particularly pictures. We know that user quality photos is a part of the website user experience. What the biggest point you should make sure is optimizing those pictures. There are a bunch of different tools out there that will allow you to optimize your photos before and after you add them to your website. And I'll send those out, send some of those out during, after the presentation via email. 
But you want to make sure you're optimizing your pictures. So when visitors from, again, from desktop versus mobile are loading your site, it doesn't take so long for the photo to load because the file size is too big. Another point here is external requests such as Instagram feeds or YouTube videos. You want to include as much points or more entry points as possible to social media or other platforms so people can engage in your content. That is fine, but at some point, if you overdo it, it can cause your website to slow down. For example, with the YouTube option, I highly suggest that you actually use YouTube, but to embed the videos that you have on YouTube, if possible, just put a screenshot and link to it. One big no-no, unless you have the dedicated or the more expensive hosting I was talking earlier, is one big no-no is actually self-hosting your videos. The reason that's an issue is because every time a visitor visits your website, that video has to be processed to be loaded. And if you're getting thousands of visitors every month, that's thousands of people sometimes will times in a month that are loading your website and that can take a huge hit on the performance and speed of your website. So you don't want to do that. Using third-party providers, like again, I said, YouTube is one, Vimeo is another, and there are a bunch of others out there, but using those would help, but sometimes if overdone, it can cause speed issues on your website. And then last, there's poor optimization techniques, and that's such as clearing the cache or deleting expired draft post pages or anything like that. You want to make sure that, that a lot of the saved memory, the memory that's on your website is cleared out regularly because, for example, if you're writing a blog post every time or every few seconds or minutes, depending on how your website is set up, the CMS would automatically save a draft of it, similar to what Microsoft Word or Google Docs, a draft is saved. But when that happens, it saves multiple draft copies that the memory of your website can be eaten up by a lot of those. And if you have hundreds and hundreds of them that have been saved and never cleared out, that can cause other processing issues for your website that goes back to the website file size. You have all these hundreds of draft or expired pages that have not been deleted. Yes, they may not be accessed, but it's not benefiting you because the storage space on your website is getting eaten up by these old pages. And let me give you a few more stats here. So based on Google developers, a source from Google developers, sites that load in five seconds see 25% higher ad viewability, 70% longer sessions, and 35% lower bounce rates than slower loading sites. So if you provide, if you do those optimization techniques, you can see it happens almost real time. You would see the bounce rate decrease, which means people are not leaving your website immediately. They're staying on your site, they're staying engaged, they're reading your content, and they're doing the longer sessions because things are not loading slow for them. They are having a better user experience. Number two, 73% of mobile internet users have come across slow to load websites. And this source is Neil Patel. He's very big in the SEO community. Now, like I said before, mobile devices do not have the processing power as desktops or laptops do. So having a mobile optimized or responsive website is a very key point or a key factor in making sure you have a good user experience. I didn't add this stat in there, but I think it's over 40 to 48% of users and it's growing exponentially of users are using mobile devices today. Just think about it. How often do you leave the house and you make sure you have your keys and the next thing you're looking for is your, not your, I'm sorry, your cell phone. People are using mobile devices often and regularly today. So you want to make sure that your website is optimized for the mobile experience because of how many people and how often people are using mobile devices. And the third is 53% of the time visitors to mobile sites leave a page that takes more than three seconds to load. And that comes from another think piece by Google. So basically what that means is 53% of visitors will leave a page if it loads more than three seconds. Again, that goes back to the user experience. If I'm trying to find a specific piece of information that you provided and have, if it takes forever to load your website, then I'm going to leave and I'll go to a competitor who has the same exact information, but their website is loaded faster. 
That's all that means is that you want to make sure that it's loading fast or optimized again for mobile because people just the time it takes for your website to load, the experience just dwindles from there and they will leave your website and go find that information elsewhere. So you want to make sure that the site stays optimized to prevent those types of issues from happening. And moving on to point number six is website security. Now, this is one of the most, um, the biggest components of your website. And it also aligns with the set it and forget it analogy that I mentioned earlier. So our computers, cell phones, any type of computational device has software built in and that software needs continuous maintenance. So your website is no different. You don't need an extensive security policy that requires you to apply for security clearance. But uh, if you're working in government, sometimes that's required, but you don't need this big security plan. There's just a few responsibilities that you can manage on your own. And that makes sure that your website is blocked from hackers, from malware, from spam bots, and any nasty type of intrusions happening on your website. And a few ways that you could do that is one, update the software on the website. I can't emphasize and I can't preach that enough. Myself as a WordPress developer, many people are familiar with WordPress core having a lot of updates, but there are also extensions called plugins. Um, you want to make sure those are up to date as well. It's the same thing as if you're using Microsoft windows and you download applications, you want to make sure they're updated. Same thing for Mac computers. It's just the same exact way with your website. You want to make sure your, your software is up to date and there is a performance component of that too. So if you're making sure your website software is up to date, it helps with the speed and the user experience of the website. And I hope you're seeing how all of this is intertwined, but moving on to the next point, you want to make sure your website is backed up and then back it up again and make sure you do it again. The reason I emphasize this is that it's extremely important. Anything can happen when it comes to software. So you want to make sure you have things backed up. So if something were to happen, you can jump right back in and restore your website back to what it was. Quick story on this. So years ago, I had a previous client of mine that had a website I built for him. He worked in logistics, so he wanted to manage his website. And it was very small, but he wanted to manage his website in-house and through his secretary. And I was like, cool. So I educated him what he should do, the steps he should take from security, for backup, what type of hosting he should go with, et cetera, et cetera. We parted ways. And then a few years after that, he came back and he asked, did I have a copy of his website? And by then time had passed so much, I did not. He had told me that his website had crashed and I was curious. So I asked him, do you mind if I try to check it out? So I went on to his website and it looked like it had been taken over by spam bots. Everything was completely different. Nothing looked like what it should have been. It was actually a totally different website. Through investigation, I found out that the site was not updated for anything. And the biggest loss here is that he did not have a backup copy, but the even worse part of that was the hosting that he had did not have a backup copy of his website either. And this goes back to the point I mentioned earlier, having a quality host. Most quality hosts would have a backup copy of your website. On top of that, you should make sure you have a backup copy of your website. And on top of that, if you have someone like a web consultant designer or someone like myself who is working or supporting your website, they would have a backup copy and probably multiples of your website. In the event anything happens, having a backup like that in that case of emergency will get your website back up in maybe a couple hours, less than that sometime. But having a quality host would also speed up that process by minutes. So make sure if you have a backup for that one and a backup for that one. Another point of security is to make sure you use strong passwords. I cannot emphasize this enough either. Originally when WordPress up until they're in version, major version six now, but up until I think it was version four, um, when you installed a brand new copy of WordPress, it automatically inputted a new user with the word, the username admin and the password was admin. And because of security reasons, hackers start understanding that they deleted that out, that feature out. You want to make sure that people are not using passwords and usernames like that, because it makes it easier for people 
who are unauthorized to gain access to your website. You want to emphasize or enforce, which can be done or many others, enforce strong passwords. And I know, and I am guilty of this, my memory sometimes is terrible. So trying to remember words for your online shopping, one for your website, you have one for Apple Music and everybody else. Trying to remember those passwords can be an extremely tedious process. What I suggest is getting a password keeper or password organizer. My personal favorite is LastPass, L-A-S-T-P-A-S-S, LastPass. I have hundreds and hundreds of passwords for many different reasons. And that program is extremely secure because I've also lost access to my LastPass and had to go through the process of regaining it. And it was a very extraneous process. But I appreciate it because of the security that they uh, took, the security messages that they took to protect my information. So I suggest if you do have a lot of passwords or you have a problem with keeping track of passwords, gain access to a program like that. So it'll help you stay on top of things and stay managed with all the passwords that you have. So now we have reached the end. I want to... Thank you a lot for dropping in, checking out the presentation today. I am going to open up the chat. If you have any questions for the next few minutes, you're welcome to ask them and I will hang around to answer them. But I thank you. I really do thank you. I hope a lot of the information I provided you was extremely valuable. Again, since you did drop in today, so some of you came in kind of after I gave this information, but what I'll do is send out the copy of the presentation slides. You'll get a copy of an ebook that provides these same points with a little more in-depth information and some of the tools that I've used, I'll send out the links to those as well. But the floor is open. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat for me. I'll wait a few minutes to see if we have any. Okay, Audrey, I noticed Facebook events for business pages now ask for keywords. Would using the Google Keyword Planner tool be effective for Facebook keywords as well? I'm going to say yes. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to say yes. The reason why I say that is usually the keywords or the typing, not typing, but the keywords or the search criteria or the search terms that people are using on one platform kind of translates between all of the platforms, between Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, try it. This is a conversion optimization opportunity for you is to go to Google, search what they're looking for, and you try to find your keywords that you would think would be helpful for you. And then give it a shot on your Google page, on the Facebook page. I don't know if Facebook has a keyword planner and I'll actually, let me write that note down. If I find something, I'll send that out too. But I would think Facebook may have some type of tool like that. And if they do, I will make sure to include that. But I know the Google one would help. It would help give you some ideas. And like I said earlier, use it, get started. And then optimize as you go, set some goals that you want to accomplish for your page and then tweak it. Just one or two things at a time. You don't have to do too many and just tweak it as you go to see how, how well different changes work to get to the, to, to the big rainbow, let's just say. But good question though. Good question. Anybody? Okay. I don't, are hashtags irrelevant or web pages? I won't say irrelevant. They, I guess you could, you know, they're not completely irrelevant. They're just not as widely searched for as they would be keywords. They are a keyword because people would search for those type of things, but it wouldn't perform as well on a website as it would on social media because the correlation of keyword or hashtags is correlated to social media. So. I wouldn't say irrelevant. I just wouldn't use it. I wouldn't bank on it being my primary source of keyword optimization. I'll put it that way. Good question though. That's a very good question. That's something I never thought of. That's a good question. I want to thank you all for dropping in. I am extremely grateful for you guys stopping by.